All right, today in Beers TV's Top Fails, you're about to aquascape your tank and you don't want to look back and say, man, I wish I had done this differently no. because it's the hardest thing to go back and redo at a later date. Today's Top Fails is definitely for you. We've got decades of experience and failures in just this topic under this roof. So today you're gonna to learn from us so that you can do it right the first time. All right, so number one is something that almost no new reefer will think about, but should, and even some of the seasoned pros are not putting as much effort into this as they should, and then they'll regret it later. What is it? This is not considering flow and eliminating dead spots in the tank. So uh, can I place a power head at the very bottom? Can I get all of the detritus in places it'll build up, you know, eliminate those kind of dead spots there? Uh, and can I do that where I'm not affecting like future coral placement? So if I'm pointing a power head at the bottom of the rocks, do I not want to have a coral there that's getting blasted with flow? Yeah, so this is like uh, the SPS uh, nuts out there will go, oh yeah, man, I need to get flow. I need to think about yeah. how I'm going to provide flow. Like, And you might think, you, oh, I got 50, 100x flow. Yeah, well, yeah, right where they're aimed. But in that dead spot, like between your two rock structures, it might be 2x flow, yeah, right? So think about how you're going to eliminate those dead spots. But also in reverse, let's say I got like a Euphilia dominant tank, right? Mm. Or uh, an enemies or whatnot. So in that case, I got to think flow, how am I going to provide flow to this aquascape that isn't going to just blast them all the time, mm. right? So think about flow and how you're going to solve that when you're building your aquascape. When you're done with the aquascape, think, hmm, this is where I put my power heads. Oh, maybe I should make a couple of changes here. All right, number two fail is super closely related to that. Yeah, the fail here is making a rock wall against the back of the tank. Like, I've seen it done. I wanted to do it myself because I kind of think I thought it looked cool, you know? But then when you think about it down the road, uh, all of the detritus and things that get stuck back behind there that you can't maintenance unless you tear apart your whole rock, rock structure. And even to the point of like, some fish go back there and hide and you'll never see them again. Uh, and I want to enjoy those fish. Yeah, so here, this is one of those things where it's a bigger fail three years from now when all that stuff's piling up and you just can't get it out of there or clean the tank properly. Mm. Year one, maybe not a big deal. But really, if you think about it, a lot of areas of your tank may have that like 100x flow or whatnot, like right in the front. But what about behind it? If you can move the rock off of the back of the tank, now I can create flow that's going all around my rock structure. I can create turbulent points where it meets in the middle, will actually come out between the rocks. Mm. It's just a way, way, way better option if we can get the rock off of the back of the tank. And number three fail, I've been guilty of over and over and over again. What is it? This is aquascaping your rock too high. So probably stems from, you know, you want your tank to look cool when you're, you know, from day one, it has nothing in there. But when we have it too high, they, I mean, the 160 is a classic example of this. The corals are up against the water. They only had like, you know, the top three inches to grow. Uh, we didn't just, didn't, we didn't think about it because we wanted it to look cool day one. Yeah, so think about where you're going, not where you are today, and you'll have way, way, way better success. Mm. And so I'll just take a rule of thumb. If you're doing an SPS tank, a vast majority of the aquascape shouldn't go higher than half of the tank because the corals are actually going to fill up the other like six to eight inches, and you're going to want some amount of water that goes across the top, mm -hmm. right? And if you're doing an LPS tank, maybe the top two thirds, uh, most of it shouldn't go above. It's uh, LPS is easier to, to manage in many cases. But you know, think about the corals that you want. Think about where you're going rather than where you are today and then build the rock rockscape so it doesn't go all the way to the top. All right, so the number four aquascaping fail, super, super common in smaller tanks. A lot of us have done this. Yeah, the fail here is putting your aquascape too close to the glass. I've been recently uh, guilty of this one myself in my 60 gallon cube. Uh, I was just putting the branch in there and I didn't think about some of the points and where my cleaning tools and my algae scrapers might run into the rock and now I can never clean that part. Okay, I saw this and immediately thought, He's thinking about where he is today and not where he's going. Uh, because not only is it like within a few inches of the glass, but the corals are actually going to grow out True. from there too. And you're going to have to clip them away from the glass. It's going to end up looking kind of funky. So in my opinion, he should go through and cut off just a couple of the branches that are the closest and then be happy with it later mm. rather than uh, trying or deal with it today so you can be happy with it later rather than dealing with it down the line. So really, again, just a case of think about where you're going, think about the corals are gonna grow, think about maintenance, don't think about what the aquascape looks like the day that you turn the lights on. 
All right, so the number five fail is actually a kind of closely related to sometimes a big wall of rock uh, and really, really large aquascapes. But number five fail is? Yeah, this is not leaving yourself room for a little island or some uh, coral that you want away from the rest of the aquascape, especially those corals that tend to disperse themselves and overtake tanks. So leave yourself some room and put a little island out there, throw them on there and that, it won't bother the rest of your aquascape. Yeah, so we're talking like zoanthids, GSP, mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms mm. uh, we're talking uh, zinnia, but we're also talking like encrusting corals. So yeah. in the 160, there are several encrusting corals that I wish we never put in there because they just like grow over the stuff that I really like. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I also like the encrusting corals, but I just want to put them in places where they're easy to manage. So putting islands in there, and like when you're building your aquascape, leaving an area, you know, for a little island to be that I can put some of those things on and if they ever get overgrown I can just fix that one rock rather than the entire aquascape. All right, number six is something all of you that are doing this for the first time are absolutely not thinking about but you should and even again the pros probably not always doing this as best we could. Yeah, this is not thinking about fish habitat. So places for territory, places for them to just kind of like hide and, you know, uh, based on the nature of the fish, you know, some like to perch, some like to be deep in the rocks, some like to have places to swim. But you got to think about this stuff when you're making your aquascape and provide for the fish, uh, especially when it comes to like territory issues. Yeah, so I think there's two things. One of them's for you and one of them's for the fish. For you, all of these fish are actually going to want to hide at different times, mm. you know. Do you want them to hide like behind your rock work where you can't see them or do you want them to hide in plain sight, mm. right? So create areas in the tank where they can get a little shelter, you know, escape some of the aggression from the other fish, but also where you can see them, you know, yeah. you'll get to enjoy it, they'll be thankful for it. And then closely related to that is the second piece is, if you just have a wall of rock and the fish can't like actually go into any part of it, well, now they can't escape each other's aggression very mm. easily. So the more like 3D you can create uh, uh, of the aquascape, more areas for them to swim in and out of, you're actually creating more habitat and you're actually creating less aggression for the overall tank because they can escape from each other. And it's just way, way, way better for the pets that you're taking care of as well as visually for you. So number seven, super closely related to that, and the visual appeal of the tank, what is it? This is not creating negative space or not thinking about negative space. So you're talking about, you know, those underneath the archway swim throughs or, you know, just some empty space up in the top of the tank where the fish can just openly swim and things like that. Uh, you gotta think about those. Can't fill the tank up full with rock and not put, or the opposite, not put, go so minimalist that there is no negative or all negative space. Yeah, really, you know, like some of the shelf rock, you can create caves really easy. You know, uh, I like this kind of thing, the branch rock creates negative space between the branches and just creating as much of that actually creates a visually appealing image, mm. but also again, that habitat for the fish and corals and just makes it a way, way, way better, more effective aquascape. So number eight, visually interesting aquascape. There is a rule for this. Yeah, uh, the mistake here is not thinking about the rule of thirds. So you can go find the photography websites or books and kind of you know hone your uh, idea of what the rule of thirds is. Basically, divide your tank up into thirds from left to right, top to bottom, and plan your aquascape accordingly. Uh, and you're just going to end up with this more aesthetically appealing you know, aquascape. Yeah, so like rule of thirds applies to any artistic image that you want to create. And a reef tank in your living room is like a living piece of yeah. art. And it's really based on your aquascape is how effective that visual appeal comes across, yeah. right? So again, you're gonna divide into thirds and you're gonna divide in thirds uh, both horizontally and vertically. And then at the intersection points should be the focal point for the eye, right? And they don't have to be through every last one of them, but you don't want it to be in the middle of any one of those blocks. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a rule that applies to almost any artistic image. So think about the rule of thirds and how you're gonna divide the tank up to create a visually interesting image. All right, so number nine is actually go out and get some people's opinions. Share it online and see what other people think of the aquascape you created. Yeah, the mistake here is not sharing that, specifically like a 3D image so I can get the whole view of the tank from sides, top, bottom, whatever. Uh, but, you know, use something like Ask BRS TV or go to the forums or, you know, share it with your reefing buddies or your local club. But 
you know, put up different types of different, you know, aquascapes like, hey, what do you guys think about this one? Or what do you think about this one? And p get people's opinions because some things might, uh, you might come out with some good ideas of maybe there's a flow thing you haven't thought of, or maybe there's a structural thing you haven't thought of. And getting the community to help you out, solid tool. Okay, so here's the thing is most of us don't want uh, feedback that doesn't match all the hard work we do. But you do. <laughs> yeah. You do want it. You want it now, not a year from now when you can't fix it. True. So, uh, you know, sometimes online people can be kind of harsh. Good, right? <laughs> I want that feedback right now when I can do it. And the most valuable piece I can tell you is don't take a picture of it actually. Shoot video. Mm. It is impossible for a 2D image on a computer or on a, on a photograph to look as cool as the 3D aquascape that you just created. Yeah. So make sure you grab your phone and create a 3D video of what it actually looks like. You can throw an image in if you want to, but the video, as it changes, you'll be able to see the depth uh, uh, of field of the whole thing and really, really get you know, how cool your aquascape is. But you want that feedback, so ask for it, and then people will help you create something you're really, really proud of. All right, so number 10 for me is uh, not understanding the right tool, right job, and really what is. Yeah, the, the fail here is not understanding the differences in rock. So you've got lime, or you've got limestone, mined rock, you've got man-made rock, you've got you know, cured live rock from the ocean, uh, you've got all these different types of rock, but when and where and how do we use it? Yeah, which one's right for me, Yeah, right? And so I'll just share a couple of different things. So Marco Rock is the stuff that we use the most uh, because it's often you know, inexpensive, pest-free and whatnot. It comes mm. in different shapes and sizes. Uh, it's been mined out of the ground like a billion-year-old reef. It's full of all kinds of nooks and crannies. It's really cool. They have like machined pieces that are flat in the bottom oh, yeah. and make great foundation pieces like this. You can stack on top of the shelf that we did in the 750. Super awesome. You can create really cool aquascapes like that. Also, uh, there's other types of rock out there. So the Carib Sea uh, Life Rock, mm -hmm. I think it's called, yep. is very, very similar to that rock except for it's been painted or dyed uh, purple, right? right? So if you want purple rock from the beginning, willing to pay like a little bit more, you have that option. Mm -hmm. Also, Real Reef is an option. This is a man-made rock, uh, so it never was mined or came out of the ground, except for they soak it in ocean water for a couple of months. So it has like some kind of bacteria on it and other things on it. So it looks like this. Uh, if you watch the five-minute guide, both of those those tanks were made with the real reef rock. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then there's the branch rock from real reef as well. So if you're just looking for different looks, all of these rocks work, right? So some of these things do look uh, more robust like day one. So the purple <laughs> rocks tend to look like, uh, you know, the live rock of old, like almost ready immediately. Ready to go, yeah. One of the cool things about building an aquascape though with, uh, that utilizes some of the branch rock is say this whole thing is just covered in, in uh, mm -hmm. corals already. And like, oh man, I don't have any place to get my favorite corals anymore. Well, I can actually glue this guy right in and all of a sudden now I have all this new area. So if you're looking to add pieces to an existing aquascape, the branch rock is a great way, instead of stacking a big boulder again on the side where you don't yeah. have room, there's one little connection point on the side there where I can add all this new available real estate for corals. So think about right tool, right job, and make sure you're getting the type of rock that is look, it's gonna make the right decisions for what you wanna create for your tank. All right, number 11 is something I see very, very few people do, pet peeve of mine, you should do this. Yeah, this is not using uh, little pieces of rock or rock rubble to fill in those gaps where your two rocks connect together. Something I had no idea about until I watched one of your old videos on aquascaping and that was like one of the things you said, you, hey, this rock is really cool, I can put it together and then if I take this little piece and put it here, it's a seamless transition. Yeah. So if you go snorkeling, nobody is going to see a pile of rocks. Uh, it just doesn't look like it. It looks super artificial. Right. So what I want to create is kind of like a seamless piece of rock that looks like it's timeless and just kind of built that way over, mm. its, over time. And so if I just you know, connect these, sometimes they fit together just perfect, right? And you can't see where one piece starts and one piece ends. And other times, I can just take little pieces and kind of glue them in there, fill in the hole, and now it looks like a seamless piece of rock. Yep. So I like to like buy one piece and then just crush it up with a hammer into other pieces and fill in the seams so you can't see the seam. All right, number 12 aquascaping problem is uh, assuming that stacking is going to be good enough. Yeah, so not gluing your rock, not using epoxy, or not using something to 
put these, uh, bind these pieces together. Uh, maybe if you, if you aquascaped on top of your sand, or maybe if you have, you know, little uh, sand dwelling creatures, they might move or shift some of the rocks a certain way, tumble your whole aquascape. If you're in there doing maintenance or something like that, you could bump into it and tumble your whole aquascape. So at, at minimum, put some dabs of glue to kind of keep that together. Glue, epoxy, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So really, really, I know a lot of people have stacked and feel like balancing act was good enough. Uh, there's just no reason not to spend, you know, 15 bucks on some glue and make sure that this thing is stable, stuff isn't going to fall off, you know, potentially break glass or anything mm. or, you know, kill the animals that are in there, you know, the corals break off because something fell. So just take a minute and take this intersection points where the different pieces of rock are touching and then adhere them to each other. So related to that number 13 is what? Yeah, this is not considering the color of your epoxy. Uh, they make purple, they make different shades of purple, different manufacturers make different shades. There's gray, there's you know bone white also. I mean, there's a different, all different kinds of mortars and epoxies you can get in different shades. Uh, so, you know, if I have like bone white rock like this and I use bright purple uh, epoxy to put them together, it's gonna be an eyesore for until the rest of the, you know, years down the road or months down the road, I get Coraline to kind of match into that color. So one of the things here is Coraline often doesn't grow real well on epoxy. Yeah. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So like think future forward again, not where you are, but where you're going. So this one's really hard for me. So if I'm using like a white rock like this, mm. and I use purple epoxy, it looks pretty ugly day one. But once it's totally covered in uh, purple Coraline, well you'll then never it looks, it. you know, you'll never see it. It yeah. looks perfect, mm -hmm. right? All right, but in inverse here, if I start with the gray epoxy with a white rock, you won't really see it, but down the road, I might see the gray epoxy once the purple rock is now purple. Yeah, right? true. So one of the tips you could do is just be kind of minimalist with the epoxy, and then again, just take a piece of rock and hide it, yep. right? So smush a little piece of rock over where you put the epoxy, or a couple smaller pieces, a bunch of them, and hide it so you don't have to see that epoxy. You don't have to worry about getting the perfect color day one or whatnot, you know, but, but think about the epoxy because you really don't want to look at it for years to come. So number 14 is actually the way that I do this uh, after all the different epoxies I've used, I've now switched over. So I think this is a fail to at least consider it. Yeah, the fail here is not considering or using super glue and Instaset. So this is something I did for the very first time on my 60 gallon cube when I was building this branch together. So I was trying to build this aquascape and you can't really build it unless you start at the bottom and you glue some layers and you build up and you kind of build up. You need to have the super glue and this is where the Instaset really comes in because I can super glue a whole bunch of uh, glue in these joining parts and the places where the rock touches then I can come along and spritz, you know, a couple squirts of this Insta set, and now I, it's sturdy enough for me to keep stacking on top of it without having to wait for the glue to dry and some pieces might bend or move or what have you. Yeah, it's not going to like hold a whole overhang up. You no, know, it no, might no, no. Day one, but you want to rely on it. But what we can do is make it stable and feel like one chunk, so it's just not rolling off mm. of each other. Uh, and so. For me, I always use little tubes like this. So the smaller ones are too small, but the big ones, I can't actually get into the areas that I want them yep. in. They also tend to uh, get all gunked up and whatnot. So these are pretty inexpensive. They're just a BRS extra thick uh, super glue. And so one of the nice things about this, again, over the bottle, is when I have a bottle and I squeeze it underwater, when I let go any pressure, it sucks water in there, which uh, ruins the whole bottle. With this case, I can use these underwater, squish it, and it doesn't have the you know, desire to refill with water again. Mm. I can go into any of the areas where one rock touches another rock and just fill in some glue right around that connection point. And I usually use my finger or something to kind of like, you know, put it into a, like a smooth angle so that you can't really see it. And for me, if you do this right, you'll never see the glue and you'll have a really solid structure if you're doing it dry, you can actually use this. Yeah, one trick that I learned the hard way about using the Instaset is it may feel really solid right off the bat because, I mean, I put some glue down, I spritz it, and it just, it's a solid connection. 
you do want to wait. I had to wait like 24 hours because the first time I tried it, I did all the InstaSet, I did all the glue, my Aquascape looked awesome. Before, I waited like a couple hours and then tried to set the whole structure in my tank and phew, it all collapsed. So it doesn't set all the way through the glue. So you just let it sit for 24 hours, then go put it in the tank. Yeah, super glue, my personal favorite option for aquascaping and making a stable stack. All right, so number 15, if you're doing an aquascape specifically with uh, Marco Rock, but really actually you did it with uh, the Branch Rock too, mm -hmm. really any aquascape, what is it? You should use this. <laughs> the fail here is not seeing the value in the foundation rock. So yeah, like I, for my 60 gallon cube, I used foundation rock. The biggest thing here, is that it manufactured the bottoms completely flat. So all of us are gonna aquascape, whether you're using sand, whether you're using bare bottom, all of us are gonna aquascape, uh, you know, on the bottom of the tank or bottom of ABS board first. And, you know, the more stability we can give this structure, the better for aquascaping on top of it. And there's nothing like the stability of a flat structure. Yeah, so there's two things here, really, is uh, the first is stability that you're talking mm. about, right? So in this case, uh, instead of having a big round rock that kind of rolls around depending on where the weight is, yep. this thing right here is flat, it's gonna sit flat on the glass, and then I'm just gonna take a piece of rock here and stick it on here, and now it's super solid on there. I'm not worrying about the bottom piece rolling around. I'll glue it together in a couple of connection points, and this thing's super solid. Mm -hmm. The other piece of it is just visual. Oh me. yeah. So if I have a big round rock that's coming out of the sand, the ground, I'll see the edges. It looks visually to me like you stacked a piece of round <laughs> rock on the bottom of the tank. Yep. I don't want that. So if I take a nice flat piece of foundation rock like this and I put it on the glass, it looks like rock is emerging from the sand, yeah. right? Yeah. And all the edges are covered up a little bit with the sand. So it just looks like the whole thing's emerging from the sand. Way, way, way more natural look to it. And again, you don't even have to use this with only uh, the uh, Marco rocks. Yeah. You could use this with any of the rocks. You know, once it turns purple, it's gonna be golden and it's just gonna be a way more stable, visually attractive rock structure. All right, so number 16 is? Uh, this is missing the value of purple rock. So probably something that uh, I think personally for me when I was first watching the, the BRS 160 may have been like, why are they, why are they using this, this fake looking purple rock? But now that it's kind of like been really popular over the years and we did you know the uh, five minute guide series tanks in it, I did the purple rock in my 60 gallon cube. I really like it because it's like, Day one, I've got a tank that looks pretty awesome and it's not bone white. If this is your first rodeo, or first reef tank rather, yeah. uh, like the purple rock uh, does a few things for me. Uh, one, purple rock just tends to, you could say that it grows less algae or pests on it. Mm. I don't know if that's true. It hides it. But it just doesn't show it yeah. the same, yeah, right? So it looks nicer day one. Uh, and uh, eventually it's all gonna end in the same place. But if you're worried about what it's gonna look like for the first year, uh, I will also say that my recent experience with the real reef rock and those five minute guide tanks was mm. pretty positive. A, I didn't see a lot of algae. I didn't, I kind of skipped some of the ugly phase just because it hides it pretty well. Mm. And you can see that this isn't like super bright, you know, artificial purple right. as well in some of it. So like, I tend to like that color better in the tank because it doesn't just like pop at me and right. look like an artificial structure. So the real reef uh, rock is probably one of my favorites. And the fact that, you know, if you use it right away, probably, you know, it's been soaking in salt water for a long time. So it probably has some of that beneficial bacteria because it has that newspaper Paper. on it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the same way that, you know, Fiji rock used to get shipped on boats and stuff. So uh, kind of real closer to the live rock uh, of old that we all used to use. All right, 17 is super simple. If you haven't heard this already, you should hear it now, uh, no debate. The mistake here is not doing rock first, then sand. Uh, I think this is easily solved, especially if you use the uh, foundation because automatically uh, with a flat surface, I know this goes down on the bottom, sand goes over the top. Yeah, so it's that simple. If you do sand first, then all of a sudden it will settle out. The whole thing can have stress points and even with glue break apart, not something you want. So make sure to build the sand or do the structure of the rock first then do the sand afterward. All right, so number 18, 
you can't really find true live rock that easily these days, and if you do, it's super duper expensive. Yeah. So related to that, what is the number 18 fail? Yeah, the fail here is not cycling or getting your rock before you have a tank set up. So, I mean, you've always, so you've said it in a lot of videos, so if, you, if you're thinking about starting a tank or your next tank, go ahead and buy the rock now, put it in the brute trash can or put get it cycling, get it going now, so that way, when the time comes, you get everything else put together, you can just you know, shorten that amount of uh, cycle time that you for your tank. Yeah. So right now, if you're thinking, <laughs> yeah, for sure I'm gonna set up a tank in the next four months. Buy rock. Buy the rock today, get it into the cycle bins, and just to gotta start getting that like beneficial bacteria and biofilm mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. You'll be way, way, way more successful later, and you'll definitely look back to this video and say, I'm sure glad I did what those guys said. All right, so number 19, there is an instance where you shouldn't listen to us on that one. Uh, you're gonna do it totally different. And what is that? Yeah, the, the fail here is not understanding that pre-cycling rock only works if you're going to aquascape underwater. So, I mean, what I don't wanna do is have this, I've had rock in a bin for four months or however many months, it's ready to go. It's got this biofilm and you know bacteria all over it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring it out here on the table and I'm gonna spend hours or days aquascaping it, then put it in my tank. I mean, we really just set ourselves backwards at that point. Yeah, absolutely. So somebody actually had asked me that about my own tank that I'm building right now. And uh, they're like, well, how come you're not cycling the rock already? You know, it's cause I'm probably gonna spend three weeks getting the aquascape perfect. Mm. Uh, or in this case, I actually have a team, uh, some guys down at uh, TSA yeah. that are building it for me. Uh, so, but like, even if it wasn't them and I was doing it myself at home, man, I am gonna toy with this, look at it, come back to it two days later, make sure I like, cause I'm gonna have this tank up for 10 years. Yeah. You know, so like, I wanna make sure I got it right. And that's just not conducive. So in this case, what I'm gonna do, I'm not, a, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm not in a hurry, I don't care. So I'll get the tank, the rock right in the tank, then fill it up, take four months with just fishing in and just enjoy the tank as fish. Mm -hmm. But if, you are going to aquascape underwater, cycling it, pre-cycling in just a bin of water is a really good way to jump site the whole thing. All right, so number 20, if you were listening to our negative space comments earlier, <laughs> this one's gonna hit you. Yeah, the fail here is not forgetting that you need additional biological filtration if you're going with a super minimalist type aquascape. So maybe I only want like a small branchy figure right in the middle of my tank that comes out. And that's it. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, but the thing is, is like the surface area of that amount of rock versus the surface area of a tank full of rock and shelves, it's gonna be completely different. And I need to consider that with additional biological filtration somewhere in the sump or somewhere else in the tank. So some of this is just closely related to how many fish you're gonna have. So somebody out there say, oh, I have a super minimalist aquascape and my tank is just fine. Two fish. Uh, yeah, I got two fish in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, others, you know, you don't really know. Like, we're not really, most of us aren't monitoring ammonia or anything mm. like that, right? So here's the thing. You just be way, way, way more successful, especially long-term in terms of stability. If you just think about how I'm gonna add filtration back into the sump, that could be just putting some bins of uh, live rock somewhere in the sump so water flows through it. I say bins just because you can clean it out really yeah, easy because there's gonna be detritus that collects underneath it and whatnot. But you can also use things like the bricks from uh, uh, Brightwell or Marine mm -hmm. Pure, those uh, like uh, ceramic type uh, bricks. There's all kinds of different things you can use, but definitely think about how, if I'm not gonna put tons and tons of rock and surface area in the tank, is there somewhere else I can put rock to help stabilize the biological filtration? All right, so number 21, we actually kind of snuck in earlier, but I'm gonna hit it again, because this is super important. Yeah, this is uh, not realizing that you can add branch later. You know, if you run out of room for corals, stick heads, uh, you know, this one really hits home for, you know, Acropora lovers and SPS lovers like myself. Terrence, Terrence kind of brought this one to mind for me. When he has, you know, he used Tonga branch for his main aquascape. And when, he has, when he'd run out of room to put branching corals, he would just cantilever like a branch in there. And instantly he's got more room to add more corals on. So, I mean, look how much extra room I got here. Yeah, instantly you can add all kinds of new area, especially for Acropora and sticks. So just really, really think about that. We'll hang out it too, too long because we already talked about it, but this is one of the more valuable tools in the aquascaping tool set. Number 22, it actually is gonna sound like because we sell you rock, we're gonna say this, <laughs> but it's true. <clears throat> yeah, the mistake here is not buying the right amount or not buying enough, uh, whether it's enough or 
too much. Uh, so, you know, there's probably some kind of rule here for pound per gallon, depending on your aquascape. But what I don't want to do is have all this shipped to me. I'm ready. I've got my Saturday plan. I'm going to aquascape. And then looking around like, I need more. And where am I going to get it? Actually, the rock is one of the cheapest things with the whole thing, right? You know, I could get, instead of getting 100 pounds of rock, get 125. And here's the thing. You'll be so much happier with the aquascape you mm. create. Because if you, if I only give you the amount of rock that you exactly need, like you're limited to, you have to use every one of those pieces of rock and they have to be the mm. right tool for the right job. And they aren't. Yeah. It just, is, it's not possible that you got a box of the perfect rock <laughs> for your tank, right? Yeah. So, and, well, and how many of us have actually not used or found uses for additional rock? Like I've got- Goes in the sump. Goes rocks in the sump. I have another tank that I want to start all of a sudden. Hey, I've already got a bunch of rock ready. Yeah. yeah. So here's the deal. I would buy 20% more rock than you think you need. And that what that will do is allow you to get the piece Pieces that build the structure that you want rather than hoping that every last piece was the perfect one because even when I say that out loud it sounds kind of ridiculous there's no way that's gonna happen you'll just be way way happier with the artistic creation that you put in your living room if you have a few extra tools to complete the job all right, so number 23, this isn't done as often as it probably should be, but you should absolutely consider this. Yeah, so the fail here is if I'm going to make ledges, I don't utilize something like a fiberglass rod. So I did this in my 93 gallon cube. I wanted this, you know, a big chunk of rock and I wanted to kind of build it out, but supporting it with super glue and epoxy, not an option. It's just too heavy. So uh, you go to the hardware store and you can find fiberglass rods. I've actually found mine here in Minnesota in the snowy areas. We have, you know, driveway stakers, uh, you know, fiberglass rods. They're bright orange, so you kind of really got to be careful about, you know, how you place them in the tank. But I found, you know, dark black and dark brown ones is like chimney sweep rods. Uh, you go to the hardware store, find some fiberglass rods, drill a hole in either side of, a, uh, either side of the rock and kind of use that to piece them together. So where this really comes together is when you want to create an overhang Mm. They would never ever like glue wouldn't do the job, yeah. right? And so I want this piece of rock to do this, <laughs> yeah, right? That's true. The only way that that is going to happen is if I drill a hole through this rock in, into this one. So fiberglass rods are probably the one of the most common uh, ways to do that. You can also find like acrylic rod. You know, I wouldn't use like quarter inch or anything, but you could use like a three eighths inch acrylic rod or mm. maybe half inch. But you can find different types of rods. I will say that some of these types of ro rocks are hard to drill through, oh, yeah. so you're going to have to be a little patient with it. But if you want to create like really oddball, like you know, overhangs and stuff, you know, epoxy is not going to do this. <laughs> you're really going to have to think about how I'm going to pin it together. Okay, so if there's one thing that you heard today, let it be this. It's more about where you're going than it is about where you are today. So envision what the aquascape is going to look like down the road. Also, if you're giving critiques on other people's, uh, you know, uh, reef tanks or aquascapes online, make sure that you're thinking about that as well. In fact, one of the things you could probably do is actually like uh, just Photoshop some corals on it, oh, you yeah. know, and sure. uh, get a better idea how this is all going to come together. But really. Think about where you're going and just be okay with the fact that day one, it doesn't look as great as it will be later. In that case, later will return out really, really nice. The takeaway here for me was uh, probably the one that's overlooked the most, and that's thinking about flow today, not tomorrow when it's harder. Uh, but ID those spots where detritus is naturally going to build up. You know, ID those other spots where I'm going to need some additional flow if I want some corals there, or where I want to place a coral and don't want flow hitting it directly. I think uh, the WWC hybrid series about flow was our best episode that we've made on thinking about flow inside the tank and throughout the system. So if you want to check that out, you can do it right here.